I'm going to review the literature on FLS. I'm going to talk about Osteoporosis Canada's FLS definition. So that's the definition that will allow you to be included in the FLS registry if you're getting an FLS up and running. Talk about the eight essential elements that are critical for a properly functioning FLS. And then I'm going to spend most of my time on the Peace Arch Hospital FLS that I was involved in and give you some idea of how it came to be, what our first year outcomes were, and what I think were some of the key factors for successful implementation. And this webinar is really targeted to people that may be interested in understanding how an FLS works, and I'm hoping that some of you may be in the process of developing your own FLS, and you'll be able to learn from our mistakes and be able to get things up and running much more quickly than we were. So I'm going to start by looking at a little bit of the literature. So there was a systematic review published in 2011 that looked at interventions to improve osteoporosis investigation and treatment. They looked at 57 studies and they were looking at the care that was provided six months after a fragility fracture and they were targeting BMD testing, that's bone mineral density testing, and medication starts. And they found that education-based okay. interventions... Density testing and medication. Sorry about that. My phone is not behaving. Education-based interventions improved the rates of BMD testing, but had limited success improving rates of treatment. And that patient education alone, although we know is very, very important, doesn't improve treatment rates at all. The study concluded that all outcomes were higher for interventions with dedicated personnel and those with BMD testing and or treatment included in the intervention. And that optimal levels of investigation and care for different patient groups had to be defined. In other words, were we supposed to be treating all patients who presented with fragility fractures, or were there particular ones that we should be targeting? Another meta-analysis and systematic review was published two years later by Ganda and his group, and that's where we started to see the different types of FLS models being described. And the Cadillac model was really the 3i model, including identification, investigation, as well as initiating treatment, 2i models being ones that focused only on the identification and investigation, 1i models only identified patients who had presented with fragility fractures, and the 0i being patient education alone, which we know is not very effective. And so this meta-analysis and systematic review really identified that the 3i and the 2i models were the best ones at closing the osteoporosis care gap. And these models are also the most cost-effective. In fact, most of them, after two years of running, demonstrated cost savings to the healthcare system with uh, decreased hospitalization costs because of lower fracture rates and decreased number of long-term care admissions. And some of the 3i models actually showed significant decreases in refracture rates, and that's really what we're trying to achieve with FLS programs. So the conclusion of this study was that fully coordinated intensive models were far more effective than any approaches using alerts or education alone. So if we look at a few specific studies, uh, this one's from the UK, where FLS modeling was first developed. And before they had any FLS programs, less than 10% of fracture patients referred for uh, DEXA and further evaluation took place. After 2000, you can see that in the non-FLS centers, only about 25% of hip fractures and 21% of wrist fracture cases were being assessed and or treated. But if you look at the right-hand side of the slide uh, in the FLS centers, this went up to 97 
and 95% respectively. So a huge improvement in assessment and treatment. And this translated into real world changes in hip fracture rates between 1999 and 2010. On the left hand side you can see in the UK where only about a third of the localities were operating an FLS, you had a 17% increase in hip fracture rates compared to Glasgow which had a fully implemented FLS service since 1999 having a 7% drop. And a cost-effectiveness analysis suggested that the UK could get universal access to FLS for just 0.6% of the annual cost of hip fracture to the UK economy. And finally, this 3i FLS in Australia, which was a prospective cohort study, found that refracture rates after four years dropped dramatically, going from 19.7% in their control group to 4.1% in their FLS group. So huge decreases in refracture rates. So this is the Osteoporosis Canada definition of a fracture liaison service. It is a specific system-based model of care for secondary fracture prevention, and it really is based around that dedicated coordinator that does the first eye, so that's identification, systematically and proactively identifying patients age 50 years and older presenting with a new fragility fracture, making sure that they get investigated by organizing the appropriate investigations to determine the patient's future fracture risk, and then finally, either initiating or facilitating the initiation of appropriate osteoporosis medications. And these are the eight essential elements of FLS according to the Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. There has to be a dedicated coordinator, there has to be proactive case finding, it needs to be the right fracture, so those that are most closely linked with osteoporosis, needs to be at least a 2i model, and there has to be a fracture risk prediction tool being used. You need to be able to either start or recommend treatment, and you need to communicate with the family doctors, because this is, of course, a program that isn't going to continue on indefinitely. There has to be a transfer of care and a transfer of communication with the family physician. And finally, you need to be able to monitor your outcomes to make sure that your FLS is actually working. So I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about the team that I was involved with. And our team called our project Breaking the Cycle of Recurrent Fracture in BC. And we went ahead and implemented a fracture liaison service at our local hospital called Peace Arch Hospital. And I became interested in the whole idea of closing the osteoporosis care gap from my experience as an emergency physician. I saw a lot of patients who came in with fractures, and of course we always did a great job fixing them up, dealing with their pain, making sure that they were rehabilitated, but we rarely stopped to think about some of the other important questions. Why did they fracture? Were they at risk of having another fracture? And what treatments could we put in place to make sure that they didn't have another fracture? And so quite frequently, these people kept coming back to our emergency room with another fracture. So just to give you a little bit of context, uh, I work in the Fraser Health Authority and Peace Arch Hospital is just one of many hospitals across our health authority. We're actually the biggest health authority by population in British Columbia. We provide health care for 1.7 million people. And in 2011 and 2012, we treated just over 1,200 patients with new hip fractures at a total estimated cost of $92 million. So in our health authority, we asked people about the care gap. Why did we have such a big osteoporosis care gap? Well, emergency staff, they really have little time for preventative care. 
And the orthopedic surgeons, while they were busy f fixing the fracture, many of them don't, didn't know much about osteoporosis treatment or about the medications, and they really didn't feel this was part of their job. With family physicians, they would be the best people to be dealing with the osteoporosis care gap, of course. But they told us that often they don't see patients early on in their fracture history. They might not see them until after everything is settled down. And by that time, they've got other more pressing healthcare issues that they want to deal with. Allied Health are busy with the rehabilitation, and patients themselves are more focused on the recovery from the fracture. After all, this was just an accident, and as long as they are careful next time, they won't have another fracture. So I just want to let you know that we tried a one-eye program, meaning that we tried a program that just identified patients, because we thought this would be the simplest way to do things, it would be cheap, and we could get it going quickly. However, like most of the research literature, it wasn't very effective. And when you look at our different subgroups, if we compare our usual care group to our group that received an osteoporosis alert in the fracture care patient handout, compared to adding in a x-ray fracture report to the primary care providers, we didn't see any difference in the number of patients referred for BMD testing, that's in the light green, or those that were started on osteoporosis medication. And that's pretty much what was seen, of course, in the literature. There were a number of barriers that we experienced in addressing the care gap when we started to look at developing our FLS. We have a lack of access to bone mineral density testing in British Columbia. For the 1.7 million people in our health authority, we only have three publicly funded EMD testing sites. We also have a lack of access to osteoporosis medications in that our Pharmacare, our publicly funded uh, medication program, doesn't cover a lot of the medications. And there are many perceptions in our province that medications are not effective despite all of the research that is available an overblown fear of some of the medication side effects, and a feeling that fall prevention and exercise programs will prevent all fractures from happening. And we do know that that isn't true. We did have a number of opportunities, however. There were uh, quite a few local secondary fracture prevention initiatives that had started to get going. We had inter interested endocrinologists and osteoporosis specialists who were prepared to follow up on the patients. And we had supportive orthopedic surgeons that were already referring patients to some of our osteoporosis consultants. And the Ministry of Health had put a big investment of funding in falls prevention, and we thought that this was a really good opportunity for us to partner with them. <clears throat> So this is just a timeline showing you how we progressed through the various stages to get to a fully implemented FLS program. And as you can see, it was a long journey, and I'm quite hopeful that most people aren't going to take that long to get an FLS up and running. We started back in 2012 by bringing together a research team, and we managed to get some uh, research planning grant funding to start moving forward and figuring out what was going to work in our health authority. And we also tried to learn from others who had done similar things before us. So we brought people from the Kaiser Permanente group in California who already had a very well established FLS. We brought people from the Ontario Osteoporosis Strategy from Toronto. We brought people from the UK, where FLS first got launched, and also from New Zealand, where an FLS is now being spread out across the entire country. And of course, Osteoporosis Canada provided us with a lot of support. And in 2013, they came up with their FLS toolkit, which is now available for anybody to use on the Osteoporosis Canada website. In 2014, we were 
ready to submit a proposal to our local hospital foundation and that got funded and so in 2014 and 2016 we were able to get going with an FLS prototype we received some additional funding from one of the pharmaceutical companies and also some funding from the Ministry of Health and finally at the end of 2016, we were able to say that we had a permanent funded program. But I can't tell you that it was easy because it was a long process. We had a very large secondary fracture prevention team and we had some fabulous project coordinators that worked with us. And these were partnerships between a number of our Fraser Health leads from all of these various departments. We also had external partners from the Center for Hip Health and Mobility in Vancouver, the BC Osteoporosis Clinic also in Vancouver, and the Ministry of Health Osteoporosis Canada. And I just wanted to highlight that we also had patient representatives. These were patients from the Osteoporosis Canada patient network, and they were really important members of our team. Our older adult program was the one that really allowed us to move forward and provided some administrative support and so we did actually have an executive director champion that was willing to work with us to take this forward if our FLS prototype was successful. And of course, as I mentioned, we did make great use of the FLS toolkit and all the appendices that are available for everyone to use on the website. So we decided that we were going to go with the Cadillac model. So that's the 3i model. And we integrated it directly into our orthopedic outpatient care. As I mentioned, uh, this took place at Peace Arch Hospital and we hired a nurse practitioner. Her name was Nancy and she worked three days a week with the three orthopedic surgeons on the days that they did their follow-up cast clinics. She used the orthopedic clinic list to identify eligible patients and these were the six fracture types that we chose to enter into our program and these are the ones that are most closely associated with osteoporosis. <clears throat> All of our patients had to be over the age of 50 and they had to have low trauma fractures. So if you were a patient <clears throat> after February 25th, 2015, when you went to see the orthopedic surgeon, an FLS coordinator, that was Nancy, would link up with you while you were at the clinic. She'd talk to you about your risk of another fracture, order the appropriate investigations, do an assessment of your future fracture risk using the FRAX prediction tool, and also do an assessment of your risk of falling. In terms of our treatment guidelines, we moved away from using bone density results as our decision making for treatment guidelines, and we moved to the 10 year fracture risk. And we focused on treating those patients who were scored at high risk for having another fracture. This is the tool that we use to do a screening for whether somebody was high risk for falls and I'm certainly happy to share this with anybody. And we also provided people with the option to go to a dedicated education class. This is a two hour education class that occurs in a building next to our hospital providing dietary, exercise, medication review and falls prevention information. Another important part of our education program though were the Osteoporosis Canada patient volunteers. So these people really provided that real life context to the patients who were coming to the education class and they were a really important part of our education program. They really gave people the sense of how a person can live well with osteoporosis. And finally, in terms of the treatments, we made appropriate referrals and recommendations to our falls prevention mobile clinic. 
We did initiate patients on medication if they were found to be at high risk for future fracture. And then, of course, there was always the communication with the primary health care provider in the community. So patients got uh, at the, sorry, the primary care provider did receive a letter when the patient entered the FLS program, and it talked about the kinds of investigations that were being ordered. And then at the end, when the risk scoring had been done, all the investigations had been completed, and a decision to initiate or not initiate on medication was made, uh, a letter was sent again to the primary care provider in follow-up. And then we did have certain criteria where the FLS coordinator would refer to an osteoporosis specialist for complex care needs. For example, a patient with long-term corticosteroid usage was always referred to a specialist. So how well did our FLS work? Well, I think I wouldn't be here presenting to you if it didn't work very well, so you already know that our FLS was successful. We did a study, we did a pre and post FLS implementation, and we looked six months after the fracture whether, first of all, a new BMD study had been ordered, and then we also looked at what we defined as appropriate care in high-risk patients. So if they were already on medication, had there been a consultation to change treatment, or if they were treatment, treatment naive, were they started on an osteoporosis medication, or if there were complex issues, were they referred to an osteoporosis specialist? So at least one of those three items had to be completed for them to be considered a positive outcome. These were our results. We ran the study over a 16-month period, and we screened just over 600 patients. We had 76 patients who were eligible to participate in the control group, and of those, 87% agreed to participate. In our FLS program, we had just under 200 who were eligible by our criteria to participate. A little bit less percentage agreed to be part of the study. However, when you looked at the additional people that participated in the program alone, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with the study, we had 95% participation in our FLS program. And as you can see, we had fairly good six-month follow-up rates in both the control group and the FLS group. We had 198 patients total presenting with low trauma fractures, and not unexpectedly, most of them were female. The average age was 70.6 years, and not surprisingly, 35% of them had had a prior fracture. So a prior warning that they'd had osteoporosis, and most of these people were not on any treatment. And there was no difference in age, gender, and history of prior fracture between the two groups. This was the distribution of the fracture types in the patients that we had in our study. And typically, again, most of them were wrist fractures. And these are our bone mineral density results. So 23% in the control group compared to 53% in our FLS group. And these numbers may look small, but because of our BND testing restrictions, we did not do testing in anyone who had a bone density test in the last three years. And we also didn't do bone density testing in any of our hip fracture patients because they were automatically scored as being at high risk for future fracture. So if we looked at the appropriate BMD testing, it was about 33% in our control group and 82% in our FLS group. In terms of risk of future fracture, again, most of our patients were high risk for fracture, uh, a little bit more in our usual care group. And when we looked at appropriate treatment in high-risk patients, in our usual care group, only 22% of patients achieved that appropriate treatment, which is typical for what we see when we don't intervene in any way. But when we look at our FLS program, it was the opposite. 
So that blue number is much bigger in our FLS program, and that translates into 76% of patients achieving appropriate treatment in our high-risk patient population. So it was really, really successful in a short period of time. When we looked at falls, we provided a home safety checklist and a guide to independent living for any of the patients who'd had uh, more than one fall. And we also, in our FLS program, referred a small proportion of them to falls prevention assessment. So you can see that 9% were referred. In our control group, not a single patient was referred for falls prevention, despite the fact that many of them were multiple fallers. And in terms of patient experience, we had about half of our patients in the FLS program that responded to a survey, and we got great feedback. 84% of them believe that their understanding of osteoporosis and bone health had improved with the program. 76% rated the help they received as 7 out of 10 or better. And 82% of them rated their experience as 7 out of 10 or greater. And we were just thrilled to see that about a third of them rated it as a 10 out of 10. So I don't think we could have done better than that. And one of the patients, this is just a quote, she wrote that she really appreciated the thoroughness of the bone assessment, the time that Nancy spent with me and my family to answer all of my questions. So many people ask about what I think were the keys to success, and I'm certainly no expert in the area. I can only speak about our team's experience. But I do think that it is very important that you have a champion. And it really helps if it's somebody who's a well-respected clinician, somebody that's been in your healthcare system for some time, therefore they're well-connected to the relevant stakeholders, and somebody that works in the hospital setting because these FLSs do take place in the hospital. Now, if you're somebody who's trying to get an FLS up and going and you're not any, any of these uh, champion criteria, you don't fill these criteria, then you have to find somebody who's going to be your partner, your champion for your program. You obviously have to have the full support of the orthopedic surgeons and the cast technicians that may work in your cast clinic. And we were fortunate to have Dr. Earl Bogash, who's an orthopedic surgeon and the champion of the St. Mike's Hospital FLS in Toronto, to come out and speak to our orthopedic surgeons because they're not going to listen to me, a family physician, but they're certainly going to listen to another orthopedic surgeon. So surgeons speaking to surgeons is very powerful. You need to address their concern that FLS will slow them down during their clinic. And certainly we did encounter that when we first started our FLS program. We all to integrate our FLS directly into the orthopedic clinic. And again, it will be a little bit different if you're going to be doing an FLS on your inpatients. But our patients really thought that it was all part of the orthopedic visit. And so they didn't really differentiate between any of the members of the team. And on the left-hand side, here's our orthopedic surgeon, our FLS coordinator, and our cast technician. And they're all part of a single coordinated team. And our orthopedic surgeons were really sold on it after they'd been working with Nancy for a good year. <clears throat> and this is just one of their quotes, the fracture liaison service has been an invaluable addition to patient care in the fracture clinic. This much needed service fills a gap in osteoporosis management. And when we had finished our year pilot study, our orthopedic surgeons were really worried that they were going to lose this service because they'd gotten so used to having the FLS program running with them. Really important to have stakeholder engagement and before we even started implementing our FLS, we met with a number of groups in our hospital that we thought were really important to work with 
going forward. So for us, it was our specialized senior clinic staff, our osteoporosis clinic consultants, the emergency room staff, and our family physicians. And one of our family physicians at the end of our pilot study said, this is a very helpful service, and they wanted us to include all patients, i.e. our inpatients, to the service. I felt that it was really important to engage osteoporosis patients on the team. They provided their real life experience and certainly having patients on our team created a much more meaningful impact when we were approaching decision makers. Engaging decision makers early on I think is really important and understanding the pressures that they're under and being able to tie an FLS program into your particular health system priorities and they're going to be different in different health systems. One of the challenges is that they do change and we encountered a problem when our whole health authority was restructured and so partnerships sometimes need to start all over again and that can be very frustrating. What convinced our decision makers to fund our FLS? Well they told us it was three things. First of all, our results. So data is really important. You have to show that your FLS is going to be effective. If you're not able to run a prototype like we did, then you can certainly use other people's data. Cost effectiveness modeling, I didn't demonstrate that because the next webinar that's going to be taking place in a month is going to talk about cost effectiveness modeling, but Osteoprocess Canada was able to prepare for us a model based on our hip fracture data. And then the patient partners. So our decision makers said when they saw patients at presentations and on our team, that really convinced them that if patients thought this was important, then it was important for them to take seriously. And finally, I do think it's important to address specific barriers that you might encounter within your health system. So you may remember me mentioning that we didn't have a lot of access to BMD testing in British Columbia, and we don't have on-site BMD testing at our hospital. So we had to negotiate with the BMD testing site to first of all make sure that we could get the, the BMD test done in a short enough time period, so at least no more than a one to two month wait, and we were also able to negotiate to have the FLS coordinator have actual booking dates and times, and that really helped a lot. We found that 80% of our BMD studies that were ordered were completed, even though the testing site was 30 minutes drive away. So that was really reassuring to us. So where are we going from here? We've sustained our FLS at one site. And we're looking for opportunities for a stepwise rollout of FLS in our health authority. And we're currently developing a guide to FLS that's tailored to British Columbia that will be available for anybody to use. And I'm just going to end here by showing you the Osteoporosis Canada FLS registry. We do have a very big country and you can see that the different FLS across the country are quite spread out. Here in British Columbia we only have two FLSs. There are three in Alberta on the map at the moment, several in Ontario, 26 at this time, and that's really because of the Ontario osteoporosis strategy, and then a few across Quebec and the Maritimes. This is a little bit of a different picture from what you see internationally and this is the International Osteoporosis Foundation map of best practice where really the FLS is now becoming the standard of care and hopefully at some point in the future we will start to see this many stars on the Canadian map as well. <laughs>